Welcome to episode 83 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Troy and the story of Dolan and Rhesus. When Odysseus returned from Achilles' reply, Agamemnon and the princess fell silent. All night long sleep did not touch the lids of the sons of Atreus. Long before daybreak they rose with troubled heart and divided the work between them. Menelaus strode from hut to hut to wake the men and strengthen their courage. But Agamemnon went to the house of Nestor. He found the old man resting on his couch, his armor, shield, helmet, belt, and two lances at his side. He started from sleep, supported his head on his elbow, and called the son of Atreus. Who are you, walking alone through the ships at dead of night, when others sleep as though you were looking for a friend or a mule gone astray? Speak, silent one. What is it you want? Don't you know me, Nestor? The son of Atreus said softly. I am Agamemnon, whom Zeus has plunged into unfathomable grief. I cannot sleep. My heart throbs and my limbs tremble with fear for the Achaeans. Let us go down to the guards to see if they are awake, for no one can tell if our enemies will attack this very night. Nestor quickly put on his woolen tunic, cast his crimson mantle about him, and accompanied the king on his way through the ships. First they wakened Odysseus, who instantly slung his shield over his shoulder and followed them. Then Nestor approached the house of the son of Tydeus, touched his foot with his heel, and woke him with harsh words. "'Tireless old man,' the hero answered, still half asleep. "'Can you never rest? Are there not enough young men to go through the camp by night and rouse the host? But you are never content to let it be.' "'What you say is true and right,' answered Nestor. I have enough people of my own, not to speak of my sons, who would perform this work for me. But the plight of the Argives is so grave that I myself must do as heart bids. Now death and life are balanced on the point of the sword, so rise and help me awake Ajax and Meges, son of Phylus. Instantly Diomedes rose, cast his lion skin about his shoulders, and called the heroes Nestor had named. Together they went to look after the guards, but no one was asleep. All were wide-eyed, armed, and awake. Little by little all the princes gathered, and soon the council met. Nestor was first to speak. "'How would it be,' he said, "'if someone ventured to go to the Trojans "'and should to try to capture one of their men "'lying asleep at that very edge of the camp, "'or to eavesdrop at their council "'to find out whether they intend to remain on the battlefield "'or return to their city as victors? "'The man who proves hardy enough to do this "'should be rewarded with precious gifts.' "'When Nestor had ended, Diomedes rose and offered.' to undertake this daring enterprise, provided someone accompanied him. Many were willing, but Agassiz, Marinese, Anticles, Menelaus, and Odysseus. Then Diomedes said, If you leave the choice of my companion to me, how can I fail to choose Odysseus, whose heart is steadfast in danger, and who is beloved by Pallas Athene? If he goes with me, I, I think we could escape from fire or flood, for he always finds a way out sooner and better than anyone else. Do not blame or praise me too much, said Odysseus. Remember that you are speaking before experienced men. But let us go. The stars have traveled far, and only a third of the night is left. They both gird on their strong armor and disguise themselves. Diomedes left his sword and shield on the ship and borrowed the two-edged sword of three Simides, his oxide shield and his helmet, which had neither a crest of feathers nor plumes of horsehair. And Marinones gave Odysseus his bow, his quiver, a sword, and a helmet of leather, topped with the tusk of a boar. Then, equipped, they left the Argive camp and went out into the night. From the right they heard a heron cry as it flew past, and they rejoiced in the happy omen Pallas Athene had sent them and implored her to favor their undertaking. On they strode through the darkness, 
over weapons and corpses, through pools of blood, and their courage was like that of two lions. When the Achaeans were planning to spy on the Trojans, Hector had made the very same proposal in the Trojan council, and promised a chariot and two of the best horses from his share of prospective Argive spoils to the man who would undertake to report conditions in the enemy camp. Now among the Trojans was a man named Dolan, son of the herald Eumuts, who was well known and respected. Dolan had stores of gold and bronze. He was ungainly and slight of build, but a swift runner. His heart leaped at Hector's words and at the promise of the finest Argive chariot and horses, those of Achilles. He offered to enter the enemy camp and go to Agamemnon's ship, there to spy on the council of the Achaeans. Quickly, he slung his bow over his shoulder, set on his head his helmet of otter hide, gripped his lance, and jauntily set out on his path. But the path he had chosen took him close to the two Argive heroes who were bound on a similar expedition. Odysseus heard steps approaching and whispered to his companion, Diomedes, someone is coming from the Trojan camp. Either he is a spy or he is out to strip the corpses of their armor. Wait until he passes, and then let us pursue and capture him, or chase him toward our ships. Both cowered down among the dead on one side of the path, and Dolan sped by unsuspectingly. When he was a bow shot past them, he heard the sound of the pursuit and stopped. He thought that Hector was perhaps recalling him through a friendly messenger. But when the heroes were within a spear's throw of him, he saw that they were foes. Then he spent his supple knee and ran like a hare before the hound. Stand I or cast my lance at you. Diomedes thundered and hurled his spear, but he missed the target on purpose. And the brazen point flew over the runner's shoulder and buried itself into the ground. Dolan halted, pale with terror. His chin shook and his teeth chattered. Take me alive, he pleaded tearfully as the heroes panted up to him and seized him. I am rich and will ransom myself with as much bronze and gold as you may want. <laughs> Be of good courage, Odysseus said to him. Do not think of death, but tell us truthfully what was taking you this way. And when Dolan had confessed all with fear and trembling, Odysseus said, smiling, <laughs> If your soul yearns for the horses of the son of Peleus, you have indeed good taste. But now tell me without delay, where did you leave Hector? Where are his horses, his armor, and the rest of the Trojans and their allies? Dolan replied, Hector and the princess sit in council near the grave mound of Ilus. The warriors are sleeping around fires and have no guards more than usual, and the allies from far away, who have no wives and children to care for, sleep apart from the rest of the host without any guards. When you enter the Trojan camp, the first people you will find are the Thracians, but lately arrived. They are grouped around Rhesus, their king, the son of Ionus. The horses are dazzling white, the largest and swiftest I have ever seen. His chariot is decorated with silver and gold, and he himself wears armor of glittering gold, armor like that of an immortal rather than of a mere man. Now that you know all that there is to know, either take me to your ships or leave me here bound and prove to yourselves that I have spoken the truth. But Diomedes scowled at his captive and said, Liar! I know you are planning to flee, but I shall see to it that you never again be a menace to the Argives. Trembling, Dolus started to raise his right hand at the touch of Diomedes' chin in supplication, but the sword of the son of Tydeus cut his throat and his head rolled in the dust. Then the heroes took his helmet of otter hide, drew the wolf skin from his body, loosed the bow, took the spear from his dead hands, and laid the armor on a tamarisk bush as a sign to show them the way home. After that, they went forward until they came upon the Thracians, sleeping peacefully. Beside each stood his team of restless, hooved horses. Their weapons lay on the ground, well-ordered in three gleaming rows. In the center slept Rhesus, and his horses stood behind his chariot, tied to it with the reins. 
These are the men we are looking for, Odysseus whispered to Diomedes. Now let us be swift to act. You untie the horses, or rather, you kill the men and leave the horses to me. Diomedes did not stop to reply, as a lion rages among goats and sheep, so he lunged wildly about, and wherever his sword flashed, a death rattled sound, and the earth grew red with blood. Soon he had slain twelve Thracians, but wise Odysseus took each body by the foot and dragged it to one side to make way for the horses. And now Diomedes slew the thirteenth. King Rhesus, who was just moaning in the midst of a bad dream the gods had sent him. In the meantime, Odysseus had loosed the horses from the chariot, holding them by the reins and using his bow for a goad. He drove them out of the camp. Then he whistled softly as a sign to his companion. Diomedes was hesitating whether to draw the beautiful chariot away by the pole or carry it on his shoulders when Pallas Athene approached him warningly and bade him hasten. Quickly, Diomedes mounted the one horse. Odysseus, running beside, urged both horses on with his bow, and thus they sped back to the ships. Apollo, the patron god of the Trojans, had seen Athene join Diomedes. This vexed Phoebus. He descended into the very midst of the Trojan host and wakened Hypocoon, the friend of Rhesus. When he noticed that the place where the king's horses had been standing was empty, and that the men were writhing on the earth in the throes of death, he called loudly on his friend in a grief-stricken voice. The Trojans stormed to the aid of their allies and halted, numbed with fear, before the dreadful sight. In the meantime, the two Greek heroes had reached the place where they had killed Dolan. Diomedes jumped down from his horse, but mounted again as soon as he had put the armor in the hands of his friend. Odysseus leaped on the other horse, and they flew over the ground toward the ships. Nestor was the first to catch the sound of fleet hooks and to tell the princess, but before they could stop to listen, the heroes arrived dismounted, clasped the hands of their friends, and related their adventures, a tale of which the warriors heard with shouts of joy. Odysseus drove the horses through the trench, and other Argives followed him to the house of the son of Tydeus. There they tied up the team by a manger filled with grain. The blood-stained armor, however, Odysseus laid down behind his ship until such a time as he could bring it, clean and bright as a thank-offering to Athene. And now the two heroes washed the sweat and blood from their limbs in the sea, sat in tubs filled with warm water, rubbed their body with oil, and enjoyed a morning meal, at which full cups abounded, and they did not forget to pour a libation to Pallas Athene. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.